Okay, let's get started. Um, so obviously you had the exam on Friday. Hopefully it wasn't too terrible for you. We're in the middle of grading it, and the plan, like last time, is we'll return them on Friday with the grades, and we'll spend at least part of the first hour going over the exam. And then we will have a discussion section Friday afternoon, to, uh, the second hour, to talk about the homework, which is due Friday. And this is going to be on Chapter 10, uh, which is the chapter on fission. Um, in looking through it, there is a section there, Section 10.4, which is really beyond the scope of this class. It's really going to be covered in your neutronics classes later. So we're not going to cover Section 10.4. It's interesting stuff, but it isn't the, the basic nuclear science that this course is really concentrating on. And um, Aaron uh, told me that one of you left a textbook in class at the end of the uh, exam on Friday. If this is yours, come pick it up later. There's no name in it. So I don't know whose it actually is. OK, so chapter 10 is the discussion of fission. And that's what we're going to talk about mainly today and Wednesday. And the first part goes back to stuff that we saw in the very first week. It goes back to this famous binding energy curve. And the fact that the binding energy per nucleon, that is the total binding energy divided by the number of neutrons and protons in the nucleus, is not a constant. It starts out low. It grows and reaches a maximum around mass 60, and then it slowly falls as you go up to higher masses. And so what that means is you can generate energy, and we've seen that there are two different ways to do it. What we're talking about right now is the fission process, which means taking heavy nuclei, ones over in this part of the chart, splitting them apart into lighter ones, and because of that variation in binding energy, energy is produced. And so just as an example, imagine you could take a very sharp knife and cut a U-238 nucleus exactly in half, OK? So you would end up with two products that have half the number of neutrons and half the number of protons that the U-238 does. And uranium has 92 protons. So you'd end up with two objects that each have 46 protons and half the mass. So they would each be palladium-119. If you ask yourself, what is the Q value for that reaction? You know how to do it. You take the mass of U-238. And you subtract from that the sum of the masses of the products. In this case, it's twice the mass of a palladium-119. And you can do it using the full formula, or you can just read it off of this graph. And if you read off the binding energy per nucleon of U-238, it's about 7.6 MeV per nucleon, according to that curve. So I multiply that by 238, because there are 238 nucleons in U-238. And for 119 palladium, I read it off. It's about 8.5 MeV per nucleon. And I multiply that by 119, because there are 119 nucleons in palladium, 119. And I multiply it by 2, because I have two of them at the end. And I take the difference between those two numbers. And what I find is that this reaction has a positive Q value of 214 MeV. So every single time I can separate U238 into two palladium 119s, I generate 214 MeV of energy. That's a lot of energy for a nuclear reaction. It doesn't mean it's easy to do that, as we're going to see. But in principle, if I can make that split, I get a lot of energy out. Now, just for comparison, you know, let's compare the energy you get from conventional chemical reactions to that of fusion. So for example, if I want to burn coal to generate energy, which we do a lot of, so what's going on? I'm combining carbon with oxygen, and I'm making CO2. How much energy do you get from that? Well, if you go into a chemistry textbook and look, you'll find that the typical energy release for a reaction like that is about 10 to the fifth joules per gram. So every time I burn a gram of coal via that kind of reaction, I get 100,000 joules of energy out. It's a lot, but compare it to nuclear fission. So this is the thing we just talked about, splitting U-238 apart into two palladiums. I get 214 MeV every single time that happens. And now to put it in the same units as what I've got up here, I want to figure out how many MeV I got per gram of material that I fission. So I know that there's 238 grams per mole of U-238. And a mole contains Avogadro's number. And then to change this into joules, I multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. And what I find then is that for fission, instead of getting 10 to the fifth grams, uh, joules per gram, I get 10 to the 11th joules per gram. I get a million times more energy per unit mass by fissioning U-238 than I burn coal. 
Okay, that's why we spend so much effort in trying to develop fission power and why we're going to spend even more effort developing fusion power because as you'll see when we go through the same analysis for fusion, you get even more energy per unit mass from fusion than you do from fission. Now that's why nuclear reactions are so interesting in terms of generating power because you get a lot of bang for your buck there. Okay, now <clears throat> let's go back to that semi-empirical mass formula and look a little more carefully at it and think about what actually happens if you split a nucleus in half, okay, or fission it. So this is the formula you saw back in the second or third week, which says that the binding energy has a whole bunch of different terms in it. There's what we call a volume term, which just increases linearly with the number of nucleons we have in the nucleus. And that's a positive number, so the binding energy keeps on growing from that term. On the other hand, we went through this whole discussion that the nuclear force only has a finite range, and so if you are a neutron or a proton in a heavy nucleus, you're really only seeing via the nuclear force your nearest neighbors. You're not seeing the guys all the way on the other side of the nucleus. And so for those nucleons that are near the surface, they have fewer nearest neighbors than the one near the center, and so they are less tightly bound. And the way we express that is in terms of the surface energy term. It has a minus sign in front of it indicating that it decreases the binding energy. Similarly, all the protons in the nucleus are repelling one another, and they're contained in a more or less spherical volume whose radius, you know, goes as about a to the one-third. So there's a Coulomb term which again decreases the binding energy. There's a symmetry term which also measures how far away you are from having equal numbers of neutrons and protons. And finally, there's this pairing term which has to do with the energy associated with having unpaired nucleons in the nucleus. Now, imagine what I'm talking about here is comparing the binding energy of two different systems. One is a system of a nucleus with Z protons and A total nucleons. In the example I gave you a minute ago, that's my U-238. And I want to compare that to what happens when I split it in half. So I want to compare that binding energy, B of Z and A, to what I would get if I split it in half and I end up with two objects that each have Z over 2 and A over 2 in them. Those would be my palladium 119s. So if I look at that formula and think about it a minute, the total A is not changing in this. I'm just redistributing uh, where the nucleons are. So the first term is not going to be different in my two different systems here. Uh, the second term and third term certainly will because I'm changing the surface area and I'm also changing the volume inside of which the charge is confined. So the surface term and the Coulomb term will also change. The asymmetry term won't change either because I divide all those numbers by two and nothing changes. And finally, I'm assuming I've got an even-even system to start with and an even system to end up with, and therefore the asymmetry term doesn't change either. So what that means is if I want to compare the binding energies of my original nucleus and that of the, the two daughters that I produced through fission, it's really only the difference between the surface energy and Coulomb energy terms in those two configurations which matter. So I take twice the binding energy of the daughters, because I've got two of them there, and I subtract from that the binding energy of the parent, and I use that formula, and this is what I end up with. So I have twice the surface energy of the daughters, minus twice the Coulomb energy of the daughters. The factors of two there are because I've got two of them. Uh, and now I've got the original surface energy of the parent and the Coulomb energy of the parent. If that difference between the binding energies is positive in the way I've written it, then fission will actually produce a lower energy state. In other words, I will generate energy there. So I can just plug in numbers here. So there's a little bit of algebra to rewrite that, and I get this expression. There's a term with some funny combinations of numbers in it, which just comes from these a to the two-thirds and a to the one-third factors. So it, there's a surface term times a, and then a little bit of numerology, Coulomb term, z squared, and a little bit of numerology. If you just grind it through, what you find is you will get a net energy produced if z squared over a is 0.26 a surface divided by 0.37 a Coulomb, about 16.4. So if you have a nucleus that has z squared over a greater than or equal to 16.4, energy will be produced through fission. And if you go back to this chart, what that means essentially is everything above mass 110 is unstable with respect to fission. That's what that says, because if you put in the Z and A for nuclei around here, they're greater than 
And if you look at that curve, that's exactly what that curve is telling you. That for everything from here on up, if you fission it, you're moving closer to the peak of that binding energy per nucleon, and therefore you're generating energy. So in principle, everything heavier than about mass 110 is unstable with respect to fission. That doesn't mean it happens at a very large rate. In fact, no one's ever seen a nucleus down here fission. As you go higher and higher, you'll see that the fission half-lives get shorter and shorter. But in principle, what I just said is true. Now, if you think a little bit more detail what's going on in the process of fission, it's a very complicated situation. We're starting out, and here what we're really talking about is spontaneous fission. In a minute, we'll relax that a bit and talk about another kind of fission. But imagine we've got our initial nucleus like this. This could be the U-238. For it to fission, it has to elongate. It has to stretch out. And again, you know, don't take any of this too seriously, but something like this must be going on. So the nucleus stretches out, and you can imagine this very much like water droplets. I'm sure you've seen water droplets or movies of water droplets undergoing this kind of motion. If you bang on a water droplet, this kind of thing will happen. And you know if you hit it hard enough or spin it hard enough, the water droplet will fission and separate into multiple water droplets. And you've heard us discuss before the idea that nuclei in many circumstances behave like charged liquid drops. And this is a very good example of that. So as the nucleus stretches, two different things are happening here. One is the surface area is going up because I think you know that for a given volume, a sphere has the smallest surface area. So whatever I do to distort it, I'm going to increase the surface area. And that leads to less and less binding energy because of that surface term. So that costs me energy to do that. On the other hand, as I'm stretching it, I'm also separating the charges more and more. On average, the protons are further apart in this kind of configuration than they are here. And that leads to a lower Coulomb energy. So that helps the binding energy. So there are two offsetting phenomena. I'm lowering the Coulomb energy, the Coulomb repulsion, by elongating the nucleus, but at the cost of increasing the surface energy. And it's a question of which one of those terms dominates as to whether fission leads to a lower energy state or not. Um, the other thing you have to think about is the nuclear potential and what's going on here. So if I imagine now a potential between the two daughter nuclei, the two fission fragments that are going to be produced, I can imagine it looks very much like the potentials we've drawn before. That is, when they're close together, there's a strong nuclear attraction, which is more or less constant as a function of separation. On the other hand, the range of that nuclear force is short and limited, so once I get beyond a certain separation, the Coulomb force drops essentially to zero. That's what this sharp edge is talking about. But then, because the product nuclei have positive electric charges, they're going to repel each other through the Coulomb interaction, and that's that long-range tail there. So, despite you know, your intuition that somehow these positive charges really want to fly apart, in fact, if they start out in here, there's an enormous Coulomb barrier they have to overcome to escape in fission. And if you go through the example I just went through, which is the U-238 splitting into two palladium 119s, you can calculate the height of the Coulomb barrier for two palladium sitting right next to each other with their surfaces touching, it's about 250 MeV. And we just went through the calculation that said the energy you get from the fission process is 214 MeV. So again, you don't have enough energy classically to allow the fission process to happen. The Coulomb barrier inhibits it. Now, you're all experts at quantum mechanics now, so you know that doesn't mean it absolutely prevents it from happening. But 36 MeV is a big barrier to overcome. And so the fission probability for U-238 turns out to be very, very small, but it does happen. So what happens then is this binding energy varies as we're stretching the nucleus out. If you end up really going to a lower and lower energy, no matter what distortion you get, that's what the criterion for spontaneous fission. What I showed you a minute ago was just the energetics. Do you get more or less binding energy when you fission the thing? And I showed you for z squared over a of greater than about 16, it's true. But that doesn't mean it happens. Because as you stretch it, there's a barrier in the way. And that barrier normally prevents spontaneous fission from happening. But if z squared over a gets to be greater than about 47, or as Lily says, 49, it just depends on what values you take for ac and as, then 
the binding energy really does increase continuously as you distort the nucleus more and more, and there's essentially no barrier to prevent the fission from happening. So nuclei with z squared over a in this vicinity will have very short spontaneous fission half-lives. And that's what we're going to see in just a minute. So this is a plot out of Lilly's book where what he's showing you is, now these are logarithms, okay, logarithms of the spontaneous fission half-lives in years for a whole bunch of different isotopes. And each set of um, characters there, like the solid <coughs> circles up there, those are uranium isotopes, then the open circles are plutonium, curium, californium, etc. And you can see that for something like U-238, you know, the log of the spontaneous fission half-life is something like 16. So it's 10 to the 16th years is what that means. Very, very long. On the other hand, when you get out here with something like nobelium, these half-lives are 10 to the minus 12th of a year, you know, a tiny fraction of a second. And what's happening as you're moving from here up to here is this fissility parameter is what it's called. Uh, Z squared over A is increasing. And so eventually, fission is the way all nuclei will decay. If you cram enough protons into them, they're going to repel each other enough to overcome that barrier and uh, uh, cause fission to be the dominant way the heavy nuclei will decay. But for lighter nuclei like the uraniums and plutoniums, I think you know now that they don't spontaneously fission primarily, they decay by alpha emission, which is another way to lower the charge. But for the very heavy guys, the spontaneous fission process is going to be the dominant decay mode. And again, just a little more detail of what's happening here. For most nuclei, this is the kind of potential energy diagram you have. And what's being plotted here is the potential energy of the initial system and then following it through as you distort it more and more all the way to the fission process. And so you can think of this as deforming the nucleus in this direction. So we start out with something that's nearly spherical. That's the nucleus that we talk about in terms of its ground state and low-lying excited states. And as we distort it, it takes on a more and more funny shape. And in most nuclei, it costs energy to do that distortion because the surface energy term increases faster than the Coulomb uh, term decreases. So there is a little potential hill that these nuclei have to overcome in order to allow the fission process to happen. And that difference between the ground state energy and the height of that hill is what we call the activation energy. That's how much energy we have to provide through some mechanism to allow the nucleus to overcome that hill and fission. And that turns out to be a very important parameter in determining which nuclei are going to fission easily and which won't. So fission barriers or activation energies uh, are the energies needed to induce fission. And if we look at the typical nucleus that we use in our nuclear power plants, it's U-235. That's the fuel in most of the nuclear power plants we have. And what's going on is that we start with U-235, and it doesn't spontaneously fission because of that activation energy that's needed. So we try to provide a mechanism to give it that activation energy. And the way we do it is by irradiating it with neutrons. And now I think you know that one of the likely things to happen if a U-235 nucleus is irradiated with neutrons is they will fuse together and make a compound nucleus. Since the neutron has no electric charge, there's no Coulomb barrier inhibiting it approaching the, the U-235. Uh, and in fact, you know that neutron cross sections often grow as you go down in energy because of that region, that reason. And so there will be a large cross section for U-235 to capture a neutron and form a U-236 nucleus. Now it won't be in its ground state because we're coming in with a neutron and let's assume it's a thermal neutron and therefore we can basically say it has zero kinetic energy. So the energy of the U-236 nucleus that we produce is right at the neutron separation energy. We've come in with a zero energy neutron, and so that's where we are in terms of energy relative to the ground state of U-236. And if you go to the back of Lily's book and calculate what the Q value for that reaction is, it's 6.5 MeV, meaning if U-235 captures a thermal neutron, the state you produce is at 6.5 MeV excitation energy. Experimentally, it's been determined that the amount of energy you have to give to a U-236 nucleus to overcome this fission barrier is 6.2 MeV. So what this means is that a thermal neutron or a zero energy neutron provides enough excitation energy to the U-236 to overcome that fission barrier. 
and therefore U-235 is fissionable by thermal neutrons. That isn't the case for all nuclei, <coughs> not even for all uranium nuclei. So for example, if we go through exactly the same discussion for U-238, the predominant isotope of uranium, calculate the Q value for it to capture a neutron and make U-239, it turns out that's 4.8 MeV. Whereas the activation energy or the amount of energy you need to make U-239 fission is 6.6 .6 MeV. So if you do thermal neutron capture on U-238, you're not above that fission barrier and therefore it doesn't fission. So fission of U-238 requires what we call a fast neutron, something that has MeV kind of energies to at least put you close to that activation energy. Now remember that these activation energies aren't really hard and fast numbers because of the nature of that potential. There's always some quantum mechanical tunneling possible, but the closer you are to it or the further above it you are, the more likely that fission will happen. So U-235 and a few other nuclei can be fissioned by thermal neutrons, and we'll see the whole list in a little bit, whereas nuclei like U-238 can't. And in order to get U-238 to fission, you have to provide more energy. That can be done by faster neutrons. And here is a plot of the fission barriers or activation energies for a whole bunch of different nuclei as a function of A. And we're talking mainly of nuclei out in here, the uraniums, the plutoniums, and they're going to have fission activation energies you know, of a few MeV. In principle, you can fission anything if you provide enough energy to it. And so even you know, mass 100 nuclei can be fissioned, but you're going to have to provide something like 50 MeV to overcome that barrier. So fission is a sort of universal process. It's just a question of how much activation energy you have to provide and how you do it. Notice that this curve isn't entirely smooth. There are little bumps and wiggles in it. And hopefully by now you recognize those having to do with the uh, magic numbers because there's extra stability associated with those nuclei and therefore they're going to be less likely to fission unless you provide even more energy. So out here, there's a peak at z equals 82, n equals 126. That's lead 208, doubly magic. It doesn't really want to fission. And it turns out there's another bump out here around mass one, uh, neutron number 184. That's a hint of yet another uh, magic number that we haven't firmly established yet, but there are theoretical reasons to think it exists out there. If we think about neutron-induced fission, and that's primarily what we're going to talk about for the rest of this discussion, uh, we can think of a sort of time sequence here. So here's <clears throat> our fissionable target, U-235, and we're assuming that we've got a thermal neutron coming in. So it makes a U-236 compound nucleus. And remember, that nucleus can decay via lots of different mechanisms. But what it needs to do first, since it's a compound nucleus, is to sort of share the energy among almost all the nucleons in it. And that takes a fairly long period of time. So the time scale to go from forming the compound nucleus to the point where it decides to fission is on the order of 10 to the minus 14 seconds. Now, you might think, God, that's an awfully short time, and it is. But remember, you know, compare it to the time it takes a proton or a neutron to travel across the diameter of a nucleus, that's 10 to the minus 22 seconds or so. So this is very, very long compared to that. So fission is often talked about as being a very slow process. All compound nuclei processes are slow, and fission is slower than most compound nuclei reactions. So eventually, the nucleus separates. There are two fragments there. And don't take the balls literally as indicating that they're going to fragment with two equal mass partners. We'll see in a minute that isn't the way it usually happens. Once they separate, these nuclei are very, very highly excited. Remember, what we just calculated was that if you separated U-238 into two equal mass fragments, there'd be more than 200 MeV of energy available. And not all of it would go into the kinetic energy of the fragments. A lot of it would go into excitation energy. Because remember, during this process, all of the nucleons are getting excited out of their ground states. And so they have much more than the average energy these nuclei would have in their ground states. And so they're very highly excited. And what that means is the residual fission fragments, these guys, themselves will decay. And they decay in several different ways. One of the first things they do, if they have enough excitation energy, is to spit out neutrons. So after the fission has happened, these guys emit what are called prompt neutrons, as distinguished from another kind of neutron we're going to talk about in a minute. And most likely after the neutrons are emitted, the nuclei are still not in their ground states. 
And so then they emit gamma rays. Finally, the nuclei settle down into their ground states, but almost all the nuclei that get produced by fission are very neutron rich, as we'll see in a minute. And so at a much, much later time scale, these nuclei undergo beta decay and emit more gamma rays, sometimes neutrons, and also these neutrinos I keep talking about. Okay, so it's a complicated process before you go from a uh, ground state of a nucleus that's long lived like U-235 to stable nuclei which are the final products of all the beta decays of the fission products. Let's talk a minute about the energetics of all this now in a little bit more detail to see where the energy actually goes in the fission process. So again, we're taking the typical example U-235 plus a thermal neutron. We make a compound nucleus of U-236 and as you'll see in a minute, when the fission happens, you can get literally hundreds of different fission products produced. The, the particular split is a random process which depends on the Q value for each particular fission product pair you end up with. It depends on the spins and parities of the final nuclei, all those things you know about already. But just as an example, suppose the U-236 splits up into rubidium-93, cesium-141, and two extra neutrons we'll see that in almost all the cases that one of the very important features of this process is you end up with more neutrons than you started with. So here I started with one neutron, I split the uranium apart, I end up with two fission fragments and two more neutrons. That leads to the possibility of what's called a chain reaction and that's the basis of the nuclear power plants we have and also the nuclear weapons we've made. We'll get to that later. So right now let's just concentrate on what happens after the U-235 absorbs that thermal neutron. And I'm assuming thermal neutron means really zero kinetic energy. So the neutron brings in no kinetic energy and also no momentum. So the compound nucleus I'm imagining is sitting at rest right after it's been formed. <clears throat> and for now, we're going to neglect the fact that there are a couple neutrons over there. We're just going to consider the heavy fragments, the rubidium and the cesium. So they are going to fly apart as a result of the fission. And since we have zero momentum to start with, and we're going to assume the neutrons carry away zero net momentum, the two fission fragments have to have equal and opposite momenta to conserve momentum. So that means one of them, which I'm just calling particle one, has a momentum P1, which is M1V1, and I've drawn it going to the left. And particle two, therefore, has to go in the opposite direction, to the right. And its momentum is P2, which is M2V2. And those two momenta have to be equal in magnitude, so that the sum vectorially adds up to zero. The kinetic energy, it turns out, I can calculate non-relativistically. And that's because, as you've seen before, the total energy we've got available is about 200 MeV. And each of these fission fragments is going to have on the order of uh, atomic mass of 100. So I've got about 1 MeV per nucleon, 1 MeV per atomic mass unit, available for each of these guys. And the atomic mass unit in MeV is about 930 MeV. So that means the kinetic energy is small compared to the rest mass energy, and therefore I can get away with using classical mechanics. If you want to use special relativity, of course, you'll get it right. It's just the equations are a little more complicated. So the kinetic energy of particle 1 is P squared over, M, over 2M for that particle. So it's P1 squared over 2M1. And similarly, the kinetic energy of particle 2 is P2 squared over 2M2. If I take the ratio of the kinetic energy of particle 1 to particle 2, and just grind through the arithmetic, it turns out it's inversely related to the masses. So T1 over T2 is M2 over M1. And so, for example, from the, the case I've shown here, if I want to calculate the kinetic energy of my rubidium 93, according to this formula, it'll be 141 divided by 93 times the kinetic energy of the cesium-141. In other words, the lighter fragment comes off with more kinetic energy than the heavy one. And in this split I've shown you, it turns out that the kinetic energy of the rubidium is about one and a half times the kinetic energy of the cesium. And that's fairly typical. And that's just because to get the same momentum in these two objects that have different masses, the lighter one has to have more kinetic energy. And so that's shown here. This is a plot out of Crane's book where there's some experimental data taken on uh, neutron-induced fission of U-235 and this is the energy of the fragment, and this is the number of events that you see. And again, this is a very typical sort of spectrum you see of fission fragments. There's a broad bump 
over here and then another broad bump over here. And from what we've just said, the lighter one, the lighter fission fragment should have more kinetic energy. So this is the light fragment over here and this is the heavy fragment over there. And if you add up those two energies, it turns out that the typical fission fragment kinetic energies you get is about 168 MeV. This is for thermal neutron induced fission of U-235. Remember we had 210 or something like that MeV available and the kinetic energies here only add up to about 170. So where did the rest of the energy go? Well, these fission neutrons, the ones that are emitted once the fission process happens, do carry away some energy. It's not very much, but on average it's about 5 MeV. The nuclei that are left after the neutrons are emitted, again, are in excited states. And these gamma rays carry away energy, about 7 MeV. These are all averages. It's not exactly true for each particular fission. And then the nuclei that are produced after the neutron and gamma ray emission, as I said, are radioactive. Eventually they beta decay, and that energy also contributes uh, to the total. And so on average you get about 8 MeV worth of energy from the betas that are emitted. You get a little bit more from the neutrinos, about 12 MeV. And in that beta decay process, again, you, pro you usually produce excited states, which subsequently gamma decay, and you get another 7 MeV from that. So all told, adding all these up, we get about the right number, 207 MeV. And all of this contributes to the power we end up producing in our nuclear power plants, because all of this is going on in the power plant. And so that's what we're going to make use of later. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, it's important that this process produces more neutrons than it uses. If it didn't, we couldn't build a nuclear power plant, we couldn't make a bomb work. And what this plot is trying to show you is the distribution in the number of neutrons that are emitted from a fission of various isotopes. So this is a complicated curve. It has a whole bunch of different uh, data sets on it. <clears throat> the important thing is to read the little legend in the upper corner. So for example, for neutron-induced fission of U-235, it's the third line there, on average you get 2.47 neutrons emitted. So you have a U-235 target, you shoot a neutron in, fission happens, and in addition to making the fission products, you get two and a half more neutrons on average. Those neutrons can then capture on other things and make more fissions happen. Um, for plutonium, it's a slightly different number. For californium, it's slightly different. Uh, the more, the better in terms of making fissions happen. So for example, here's U-233. That's a nice one, 2.6 uh, neutrons per fission. And it doesn't take a very big difference in that mean number to make an enormous difference in how your reactor is going to run because it's a multiplicative process, as we're going to see. So if each generation gives you exactly two neutrons, you can calculate two to the n just fine. If you get 2.5, 2.5 to the n suddenly becomes a lot bigger than 2.2 to the n after n generations. So that's an important number, the mean number of neutrons emitted. And it's especially important when we go to talk about what are called breeder reactors, ones which produce more fuel than they use up. We'll see that in a little bit. In addition to... Um, how many neutrons there are, there's a spectrum of energies that the neutrons carry away. And remember, we discussed this kind of thing earlier, that these compound nuclear reactions involve sharing the energy with almost all the nucleons in the nucleus, and it's only through a chance set of collisions that one nucleon ends up with enough energy to overcome its separation energy and escape. And so you end up with a sort of thermal distribution of neutrons coming out of nuclei, and you've seen this kind of plot before, but not in the discussion of fission. But if you look at the fission neutrons, the ones that are produced immediately after the fission separation, you get a spectrum that looks like that. This looks like Maxwell-Boltzmann thermal energy distribution, and in fact you can characterize it with a temperature if you want. The point is that the average energy is somewhere around an MeV or so. But there is a tail which goes up to 5, 6 MeV. So you don't get monoenergetic neutrons coming out of fission directly, um, but you get a distribution. If you look in detail about how the split happens, the example I showed you was one of what I said were hundreds. Uh, if you actually look at all the different distributions of fission, this again is from thermal neutron induced fission of U-235, you get a spectrum that looks sort of like this. So what's being plotted here is the mass number of a fission fragment versus the probability in percent that it actually happens. And what you see is two sort of peaks. 
one roughly around mass 90, and another roughly around mass 140. That's these two slightly unequal mass fragments, a light one and a heavy one. But it's a continuous distribution, and you can see that there's actually a fairly large dip in the middle. Remember, this is a log plot, so the abundance of these things compared to those is three or four orders of magnitude different. This split in here would correspond to the symmetric splitting of the U-236 into two you know, palladium 118s. That's a very rare process, but it, it does happen to some extent. What's more likely is to get this 90-140 kind of mass splitting. And each fissionable isotope will have a slightly different uh, mass distribution, but most of them look like this. This is called an asymmetric mass distribution, meaning I don't have a peak sitting at exactly half the neutron and proton numbers of the parent. I get a peak at light masses and a peak at heavy masses. And here are plots which were similar to that one, but for different systems. And you'll see that for most of them, they have this asymmetric pattern, um, a light fragment and a heavy fragment with a dip in the middle. When you get to very, very heavy nuclei, like this fermium-256, that's an interesting case. I don't know if you can see it from the back, but the peak of that distribution really is at a 50-50 split. Okay, that's called a symmetric split. And it turns out the reason for that is that fermium has Z of 100, and when you split it apart, you get Z of 50. 50 is a magic number. And so the thing likes to split apart into magic number nuclei, and so that's why you end up with that symmetric distribution for something like fermium-256, whereas for uranium and plutonium, you get these asymmetric splits. You can look in gory detail at these fission fragment distributions for each and every fissionable nucleus, and the fact that these are slightly different allows you to distinguish what it was that fissioned by looking at the distribution of the fission fragments. So, for example, if you were interested in nuclear forensics and, let's say, a nuclear weapon went off somewhere and you picked up some of the debris, uh, if you look at the debris, you can actually figure out whether it was plutonium or uranium that made that fission weapon work because of that slight difference in the mass distribution of the fission fragments. And this just shows you a little bit more about that. So what this is showing you is the mass of the fissioning nucleus. So we're imagining we're fissioning nuclei that range in mass from 230 up to 260. And there are two different plots here. One is the mean mass of the heavy fragment. That's what's shown up top. And notice that as the fissioning nucleus changes, the mass of that heavy group really doesn't change at all. So the heavy group stays pretty much fixed at around mass 138, 140, regardless of how heavy the system was that underwent the fission. Whereas the light mass peak is the one that moves around. It moves from about 86 up to 110, depending on the mass of the fissioning fragment. So it's that light mass peak shifting, which is the signature of which particular nucleus underwent the fission. If you're interested in this, of course, there are databases available. Um, if you go to the Isotope Project's website at LBL, uh, there are databases for thermal neutron-induced fission, fast neutron-induced fission, spontaneous fission of all the nuclei that have been studied. And this is just one set of data I pulled off for thermal fission of U-235. These are tables that were compiled a long time ago at Los Alamos. And this is the kind of information you get. So if you look at mass 93, there are a whole bunch of different isotopes of mass 93 that get produced as a result of the fission. This is the half-life of each of these isotopes. Remember, they're all going to be radioactive and they're all going to beta decay. Um, this is what's called the independent yield. And what that means is, as a direct result of the fission process, immediately after the fission has happened, which nucleus am I sitting in? And so, for example, if I look at rubidium-93, 3.07% of the time when U-235 undergoes a thermal neutron-induced fission, rubidium-93 is produced directly. On the other hand, I can also produce other nuclei, like the bromine-93 and the krypton-93, which eventually beta decay and produce rubidium-93. And that's what this cumulative yield is meant to represent. So what this is saying is that, okay, I make Rubidium-93, 3.07% of the time directly, and then if I wait a while, these guys will decay into it, and so the cumulative yield is actually more, it's 3.55%. And it's even more striking for something like, if I go down here, 
or even go down here. Okay, here's niobium-93 isomer, 12-year half-life. The probability of producing it directly as a result of fission is nearly zero. This is 10 to the minus 10. But if I wait a while, all of these guys eventually decay there and contribute a total yield 6% to that nucleus. So if you get a question about, you know, what is the abundance of a particular nucleus after fission, it's a fairly complicated process to go through and figure out, first of all, how much got made directly, and then how much gets produced as a result of the decays of all the, the more neutron-rich precursors that eventually feed it. But all the data is there, and it's a very interesting problem to go through. And just to show you again, if you look at the nuclear wall chart, there's one outside my office and there are a bunch of them around the building. In addition to showing you all you know, the individual nuclei and what their properties are, there's information on fission yields there. That's what these arrows represent. So in fact, there are several arrows, but this is trying to show you the fission yields from neutron-induced fission of U-235. And so for example, this little arrow that says 4.31 on it means that 4.31% of the time when U-235 undergoes fission, you get a nucleus of mass 132. Because all of these nuclei along here have the same A, that's what this number represents. But it doesn't tell you exactly how much of this particular nucleus, the cadmium-132 versus the indium-132 or the tin-132, were produced directly as a result of fission. For that, you have to go back to that kind of table. But you can see, for example, here, these numbers over here, mass 78, 79, 80, these are very small. They're fractions of a percent. I get up to about 6 or 7 percent here, and then they start falling off again. This is indicating that there's a peak in the fission fragment distribution around mass 138, 140. And if I go down to mass 90, you'll see a similar distribution of these numbers starting small, reaching a maximum, and then dropping again once I pass mass 90. So there's a lot of information there. And the point of all this is that in addition to being able to figure out how much of the time you make a given A chain, as they're called, a uh, chain of nuclei of a given A, uh, these nuclei are all very neutron rich. In fact, in this portion of the chart, there's only one stable nucleus over there, tellurium-130. All of these are more neutron rich than that. And what that means is these are all going to undergo beta decay with varying half-lives. So if I go back to my example here, the cadmium-132 has a frac 0.01 seconds. This is 0.29 seconds. This is 29 seconds, minutes, and so on. They get progressively longer as I get closer and closer to stable nuclei. But the ones out here are very, very short-lived. And why are they short-lived? Why should these nuclei be shorter-lived than the ones over there? Right, they're further out on the mass probe. They're more and more neutron-rich. The Q values are higher. And as you now all know, the higher the Q value, the faster the beta decays go, all other things being equal. Okay. Now, because these Q values are so high, in addition to the standard beta decay to excited states, which then decay by gamma ray emission, in a number of these cases, you get a situation like the one shown here for bromine 87. It has a very large Q value. It's something like 8 MeV. And that Q value is a reflection of the difference in mass between the parent ground state and the daughter ground state. So the 8 MeV is that difference. And when I have a beta decay, I can beta decay to states which are above the neutron separation energy in that daughter nucleus. And then I, that excited state will then decay by emitting a neutron rather than emitting a gamma ray. And so I get beta delayed neutron emission, which I talked about the other day. And so in this case, I go from bromine 87, I beta decay to krypton 87, and then the excited state kicks out a neutron and leads to krypton 86 plus a free neutron. In addition, I can also just beta decay to states that don't emit neutrons and end up decaying down here. This beta delayed neutron emission turns out to be very, very important when we go to talk about how it is nuclear reactors actually run. If it weren't for this process, we couldn't build nuclear power plants, it turns out. You might think it's just sort of esoteric and you know, who cares, but that's how we are able to regulate nuclear power plants because of the fact that this happens. And you'll see why in a little bit. Um, so what we're primarily interested in is neutron-induced fission, and what we need to then understand are the cross-sections for the various reactions that neutrons can induce on both the fissionable and non-fissionable materials, or at least the ones that can't be fissioned by the thermal neutrons. So these are plots 
attempting to show that to you. And if I think about, let's say, a neutron interacting with U-235, based on what we've talked about so far, what are the things that can happen? I shoot a low energy neutron at U-235. What can happen to it? It gets absorbed in fission. Sure, that's what I've been talking about for the last hour. Very good. You were awake. Okay. What else can happen? Is that the only thing? Yeah, it can scatter. I mean, we're not talking about missing it, but it can scatter. It can elastically scatter or even inelastically scatter without being captured. That's right. Okay, what else? I'm sorry, say that again? Yes, exactly. It can be captured and then it can gamma decay. Right? That, that's certainly a possibility. So I can have capture with fission happening afterwards. I can have capture without fission happening. I can have scattering happen. All of those things contribute to the total cross-section, the total probability for a neutron to interact with the uranium. And that's what's being shown here. So in the upper plot, this is the situation for U-235, and this is being plotted on a logarithmic energy scale. So this is one electron volt, thousand electron volts, million electron volts for the kinetic energy of the neutron. And what you can see here is that the total cross-section, that's sigma t, that's the sum of all these processes. It's the sum of the scattering cross-section, the capture cross-section, and the fission cross-section. The total cross-section for U-235 at low energies, the total cross-section is very nearly equal to the fission cross-section, because that's mainly what the nucleus does. It falls like one over the velocity at low energies, like we've seen before. It's typical for a lot of nuclei. Then there's a bunch of wiggles here. What are those things? Resonances, right? We talked about that. These are kind of chance situations that develop in a nucleus where the neutron comes in with just the right energy so that the compound nucleus is at the energy of a bound excited state or a virtually bound excited state. That's what these resonances are. And when you write on resonance, the cross-section gets very big, the bright Wigner resonances we've talked about. Once you get over that, it's not that there aren't any more states anymore. It's just that they all are so closely spaced and they're all so wide in energy that they blur together and you don't see individual states anymore. And the cross-section just continues falling. There is still a fission cross-section, but now there are other processes that can happen. When I get up high enough in energy, I can do inelastic scattering. So NN prime, and I produce an excited state in the nucleus. Eventually, if I go higher still, I can do N2N. I hit the U-235 and I knock another neutron out. All of those things contribute to what's called the total cross-section, and the fission cross-section just keeps on dropping. If I make the same kind of plot for U-238, on the other hand, we just went through the discussion that for low-energy neutrons, they can't induce fission on U-238. And so here, this total cross-section represents the capture, U-238 plus a neutron making U-239 plus a gamma, or just scattering. And the cross-section is fairly independent of energy until I get to these resonances. These correspond to discrete states in the U-239 compound nucleus. And again, fairly flat. The fission cross-section isn't zero, it's just that I have to provide a lot of energy via the neutron. So it starts at a bit over an MeV and then gradually grows. And when we get up to something like 14 MeV, it turns out that the cross-section for inducing fission on U-238 is almost exactly equal to that for U-235. Because this one has a threshold and grows, and this one just keeps on decreasing. But at low energies, the U-238 is not fissionable, whereas the U-235 is. And just to show you a little more what happens when you go up higher in energy, uh, this is for neutrons on U-238. I just showed you that at low energies, the cross-section for neutron induced fission is very small. It turns on around an MeV and grows rapidly, and then more or less plateaus for a while until you get up to about 7 MeV or so. There's another big step, another plateau, until you get to maybe 13 or 14 MeV, another big step, another plateau, and so on. Any idea what's going on there that would make these steps and plateaus? What happens around 7 or 8 MeV in any nucleus? Yeah. Right, very good. It's a neutron binding energy. So when I get up here, I've got enough energy to kick a neutron out and then fission. 
It's called second chance fission. So my primary neutron comes in, I make a compound nucleus, in this case of U239. It's highly excited enough that it kicks out a neutron and is still above the fission activation energy, and so then it fissions. That goes on for a while, and then I get to the point where I have enough energy to emit two neutrons and still fission, and three neutrons and fission, and so on. So this is called first chance fission, meaning my primary neutron comes in and induces a fission. Here, I've emitted a second neutron, and then the fission happens. That's second chance fission, third chance fission, and so on. And depending on how much energy my original neutron brings in, I can do one or more of those processes. And so this is a very typical pattern for high energy neutron induced reactions on any heavy nucleus. It'll always look more or less like that. And then just to finish up, these are fission cross sections for a whole bunch of different fissionable isotopes. Uh, trying to show the cross, so here's the isotope over here. Again, you can't read it from the back. Uh, a number of these isotopes have very large cross sections and these are for thermal neutron fission. So for example, if I find my U235, which is this guy, 584 barns. Hopefully by now you realize that's a very large cross section for you know, a little wimpy neutron to come in with a fraction of electron volt and produce a process that liberates 200 MeV. It's got nearly a 600 barn cross section. If I go down to plutonium 239, it's even bigger, 742 barns. There are some isotopes that have even larger for example, here's americium-242, 2,100 barns. Here's neptunium-236, 3,000 barns. Um, hundreds of barns are big, thousands of barns are enormous. And then you'll see ones which have very small cross sections. So here's the U238. For thermal neutrons, the cross section is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 6 barns, a microbarn. Doesn't mean it's zero, but it's very, very small. So if you're interested in making a nuclear power plant, what you want to find is a nucleus that has a very large cross-section for thermal neutrons. And so you can see there are not so many that you can use. And furthermore, if you're going to want to make a lot of power, which is what we're going to do, uh, you want something where you can get a lot of mass of that material. And pretty quickly that restricts it to just a few nuclei that are really serious candidates for using for nuclear power or for nuclear weapons. And I'll stop here for today and we'll pick up here on Wednesday and start talking about how we use these things to make nuclear power plants work.